observations on the defense of purchase for valuable consideration without notice by Freeman Oliver Haynes, Chapter 2. We proceed now to Lord Westbury's second class of cases that of several purchasers or encumbrancers claiming an equity of whom one who is later in time has succeeded in obtaining an outstanding legal estate, in which cases Lord Westbury says the principle is that a court of equity will not disarm a purchaser. We'll repeat that because it's a maximum of equity. Mm, court, a court of equity will not disarm a purchaser. A court of equity will not disarm a purchaser because the purchaser is doing so in equity. The first mention of this doctrine occurs three years earlier than the decision of Bassett v. Nasworthy, the leading case in respect to our first class, and the cradle of it may be said to be Marsh v. Lee, A, which was decided by Lord Keeper Bridgman. With the assistance of Lord Justice Hale, then Chief Baron Anne Rainsforth J. in the year 1670, and it was on that occasion, as it is believed, that Lord Hale made use of the expression so often since referred to of tabula in naufragio. Hmm. All right, we're going to look it up again because uh, it's hard to remember. <laughs> hmm. Okay, tabula in naufragio. Literally a plank in a shipwreck, a graphic expression applied to the saving of a junior equity, which also means a share, by acquiring the legal title. Okay. The doctrine applies both to purchasers in the ordinary popular sense of the word and to mortgagees who are partial purchasers. The most frequent occasions for its application are the first cases of first a mortgage and then a sale suppressing the mortgage or of several consecutive mortgages, someone or more of the earlier being concealed on the occasion of a later one being made. The most familiar statement of the doctrine as applied to the particular instance of several mortgages is to be found in Brace v. Duchess of Marlborough. A, decided by Sir Joseph Jekyll, who there laid down first, that if a third mortgagee buys in the first mortgage, though it be pending a bill brought by the second mortgagee to redeem the first, yet the third mortgagee having obtained the first mortgage, and got the law on his side in equal equity, he shall thereby squeeze out the second mortgagee, and this the Lord Chief Justice Hale called a plank, gained by the third mortgagee or tabula in naufragio, which construction is in favor of a purchaser, every mortgagee being such pro tanto. From, mm -hmm, I have to look that up too, pro tanto. All the way, all the way. P Q R S T P. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we go. Pro tanto for as much for as far as it goes to such an extent. Here we go. But sixthly, his honor said, in all these cases, it must be intended that the Pusin Pusni mortgagee. That means the young man. Oh, we're going to look it up. P, P, Q, R, S, P. Mm, where is it? How do you spell it? P, U, I, S, N, E. P, oh, I know I saved it. <laughs> mm, P, U, I, S, N, E. P, U, I, S, N, E. R, oops. No. Mm. Younger, junior, in point of time, right or rank. So, 
like the youngest son or younger son. But sixthly, his honor said, in all these cases, it must be intended that the Quisney uh, Murgy <clears throat> or Pusne Murgy, when he lent his money, had no notice of the second mortgage. Hmm. The case supposed here by Sir Joseph Jekyll is that of a Pusne Murgy getting in the first legal mortgage. But the doctrine applies equally wherever the purchaser or mortgagee whose title is later in point of term, has acquired any legal estate subject to the qualification which we shall presently find to exist. In those cases in which the legal estate has been obtained, not from a mortgagee, but from a trustee. In connection with this branch of the subject, let us first consider the distinction which exists between a first legal mortgagee and a person in whom a legal estate is vested as trustee. A mortgage is not trustee for his mortgagor. Still, less is a first mortgagee, a trustee for a second mortgagee. A second mortgagee may, if he think fit, give notice to the first mortgagee of his own mortgage, but that notice cannot in any way fetter the right of the first mortgagee to transfer his mortgage to any one and as he may think fit. If this were not so, the rights of the first mortgagee, as existing immediately after taking his mortgage, would be diminished and prejudiced by the subsequent act of the mortgagor. It follows, therefore, that so long as the first mortgage is unsatisfied, so long may the first mortgagee transfer it to any one and consequently to the third mortgagee, so as to enable the latter, if he had no notice of the second mortgage at the time of taking his own security to squeeze out the second mortgagee. A, there is one restriction only on this general right to transfer. The transfer cannot be made after a decree in a suit for foreclosure or for otherwise determining the rights of the various encumbrancers. B, nothing, however short of a decree, is sufficient to restrict the right, not even a submission by a first mortgagee made by answer in a suit instituted against him by a second mortgagee to assign a security on being paid the amount due to him. A, suppose, however, a mortgagee to have been paid everything that is due to him on his mortgage without reconveying and without bargaining or undertaking on his part to transfer his security. What is his position? It is that of trustee for the mortgagor or for the various encumbrancers according to their legal priorities. It differs to some extent from that of an express trustee because the express trustee must know, or at least is presumed to know the contents of the instrument declaring the trusts on which he holds, whereas the satisfied mortgagee may only be partially acquainted with the encumbrances executed by his mortgagor, and so far as he has no notice of them, cannot be affected with the duties of a trustee towards the unknown encumbrancers. Subject to the foregoing qualification, a satisfied mortgagee may be treated for the purpose of the following discussion as a trustee. Let us now consider the cases in which the latter purchaser or encumbrancer has obtained the legal estate from a trustee. Some of the old decisions seem at one time to have favored the view that a bona fide purchaser for value who had no notice at the time when he paid his money or gave his money's worth was entitled to protect any subsequently discovered infirmity in his title per fast out nefas, even by fraud or theft. Nefas, nefas, oh, come on. I know I looked it up. Mm, hello? I just thought. Yep. Nefas. Foss out nefas. Foss out nefas. I spelled it right. Oh, I did not do that. Weird. Maybe I had to look at something. Oh, my 
shop. Right, I see. Oh, All right. Hmm. Oh yeah, it starts with a P, I forgot. All right, by what is proper or improper by any means, regardless of legality or ethics? Let's see if I have it in PQR. Per. Yep, I have it. All right. All right. Thus, in Huntington v. Greenville, A, we find Lord Chancellor Nottingham referring to Sir John Fagg's case, where he, Sir John Fagg, being a purchaser, came into a man's study and there laid hands on a statute that would have fallen on his estate and put it up in his pocket. And in that case, he, having thereby obtained an advantage at law, though so unfairly and by so ill practice, the court would not take that advantage from him. It is clear that such a decision as that to have been come to in Sir John Fagg's case could not be tolerated. No man could be allowed to reap a benefit from fraud or malpractice. Accordingly, within only 10 years after the reference made by Lord Nottingham to Fagg's, Fagg's case, we find it distinctly established that a purchaser for value without notice cannot even avail himself of a legal estate voluntarily conveyed to him where the conveyance is a positive known breach of trust on the part of both the conveying party and the purchaser for value. The leading authority on this point is Saunders v. Dehu. There, Anne Blot Bailey, being possessed of a term of years, made a settlement under which her daughter, Isabella, took a life estate. Isabella made a mortgage, professing to be entitled to the property absolutely. Then the mortgagee, discovering that Isabella had no title, got an assignment of the term from the trustees and filed a bill to foreclose, and it was held that the mortgagee could not avail herself of the legal estate thus acquired. The court said, though a purchaser may buy in an, enc an encumbrance or lay hold on any plank to protect himself, yet he shall not protect himself by taking a conveyance from a trustee after he had notice of the trust. For by taking a conveyance with notice of the trust, he himself becomes the trustee and must, and must not, to get a plank to save himself, be guilty of a breach of trust. Hmm. If then a purchaser for value cannot protect himself by means of a legal estate obtained from a trustee in breach of trust with full knowledge of both parties, the question is, when may he protect himself by means of a legal estate obtained from a trustee? We propose examining in detail this question, which seems to have been partially obscured by reason of the expressions used in its discussion. In certain cases, having been treated as applicable to others in which the circumstances were materially different. And first, it is to be noticed that in Saunders v. Dehu, which we have used by way of preface, so to speak, the legal estate was acquired by a transaction subsequent to and distinct from that upon the occasion of which the purchaser for value paid his money. Before considering cases of that description, let us first consider those in which the legal estate is acquired as part of the very same transaction. Hmm. Now, when a trustee, either upon express trust or being a person in whom a legal estate is vested, but not as an express trustee concurs in a conveyance or mortgage by the alleged equitable owner to a purchaser or mortgagee, he may do so under the following four different states of circumstances. One, the trustee and the purchaser or mortgagee may both be aware of the trust in the conveyance or mortgage may be made in defense, defiance of this knowledge. Two, they may both be ignorant. Three, the trustee may know of the trust and the purchaser or mortgagee may be ignorant or the trustee may be ignorant and the purchaser or mortgagee may have knowledge. The first of these supposed states of circumstances gives rise where the whole transaction is contemporaneous. No room for discussion. The purchaser or mortgagee knew everything from the beginning and is really not a purchaser without notice. Will be versus will be. A, the case to which we owe the celebrated and elaborate judgment of Lord Hardwick was in one of its main features, a case of the description first supposed. The second state of circumstances, 
though almost impossible where the trustee holds upon an express trust may well arise where the trustee is a person in whom, in consequence of a prior mortgage, having been satisfied, a dry legal estate is vested without notice of the true equitable title. It did in fact arise in the case of Jones v. Powell's A, there one. Jones, who was seized in fee, I mean seized, made in 1800 a legal mortgage. This mortgage was paid off in 1808, but no rec reconveyance was taken, so that the legal estate was left outstanding. In 1814, Jones died. At his death, one Meredith took possession of the property, claiming under a will of Jones, which, though proved in the ecclesiastical court, was in fact forged. Shortly after Jones's death, Meredith borrowed money on the security of the property, and on that occasion, the mortgagee of 1800, in whom the legal estate was outstanding, concurred in conveying to the new mortgagee. There were various further advances, transfers, and other transactions, some before, some after, notice that the will was a forgery, and it was held that as to all monies paid by the defendant before notice, the defense of purchase for valuable consideration without notice must apply, and that the accounts must be taken as against the plaintiff who claimed under the true title on that footing. The third state of circumstances, viz., that of the trustee who concurs in the conveyance or mortgage having knowledge, all the purchaser or mortgagee is ignorant of the trust implies, of course, positive fraud on the part of the trustee. In such a case, it is clear that the purchaser or mortgagee is entitled to the protection of the legal estate thus acquired by him in innocence on his part. This is distinctly established <laughs> by the recent decision of Pilcher v. Rollins. A, we ought perhaps to say decisions for there were two distinct fraudulent transactions, the circumstances of both of which fall under this or third head. The facts of the first transaction were as follows. <clears throat> A, B, mortgage to three trustees, the trust being disclosed of whom C.D. was the survivor. C.D., without consideration, fraudulently released to A.B., and then A.B. suppressing both mortgage and reconveyance, mortgage to E.F. for value and without notice, and it was held that E.F. had priority. In the second transaction, there was, as in the first, a mortgage by A.B. to three trustees, the trust being disclosed, of whom C.D. was the survivor. Then A.B. executed to C.D. a purchase deed, which was in effect a sham, no money passing and CD professing to be absolutely entitled under the sham deed and having in fact the legal estate of surviving mortgagee, mortgage to GH without notice of the first mortgage and it was held that GH had priority. It was argued in each case that the title to the legal estate being traceable only through deeds, in the first case, the valid mortgage and fraudulent release and in the second case, the valid mortgage alone, which disclosed the trust, the respective mortgages, EF and GH, must be deemed to have had notice of the trust. But that view, though upheld by the court of the first instance, was considered untenable on appeal. And it being thus settled that EF and GH, who were in fact ignorant, were not affected by constructive notice. The result as stated under a third head follows us, of course. Here we may conveniently notice some observations of Lord Hardwick in his judgment in Willoughby B. Willoughby, A, which seems to have been considered by Lord Eldon as presenting considerable difficulty, but which are, it is submitted, perfectly clear and consistent if they are regarded as applied, not to a case where the legal estate is got in, by a transaction subsequent to that on the occasion of which the money was paid, but as was a case in will be, be, will be, as part of the original transaction. Lord Hardwick, after referring to the position of trustees to preserve contingent remainders, says, it is just the same here. If the Pusne purchaser or mortgagee has notice of the prior purchase or encumbrance, he shall not avail himself of the assignment of the term. B, shall but shall be decreed to reconvey or procure it to be reconveyed. If he has no notice, he must retain it. But if the trustee who joined in the assignment 
a notice of such prior purchase or encumbrance, his conscience was affected by the trust. It was a breach of trust in him, and he ought to be decreed to make satisfaction. This is, in my opinion, what equity would demand. In reference to these words, for it is assumed mm -hmm. that to them, ref to them reference was intended to be made. We find Lord Eldon saying, A, one of the greatest difficulties I met with in deciding the case of Mondrel, B. Mondrel, was Lord Hardwick's expression that the purchaser would be safe in taking the assignment if he could get it, but his lordship would not say the trustee would be safe. Surely, if the purchaser would be safe, the trustee ought to be so. Unless there be some misconception on the part of the present writer as to the particular observations of Lord Hardwick, to which reference was intended to be made, it is submitted that the whole difficulty arises from treating them as having been made in respect to the operation of getting an illegal estate from a trustee by a transaction separate and distinct from the original purchase or mortgage, instead of to a case where the legal estate is obtained as part of the original transaction. The fourth state of circumstance Stances does not so far as the writer is aware occur in any reported case, but it seems clear upon principle that the purchaser or mortgagee could in no sense be a purchaser for value without notice and could not therefore be protected by any legal estate so acquired. We pass now to the consideration of the cases in which the legal estate is acquired from the trustee by a transaction subsequent to and distinct from that of the original purchase or mortgage. Here again, we may have the same four states of circumstances as those mentioned in reference to the contemporaneous acquisition of the legal estate. A, the first, where both trustee and purchaser or mortgagee knew of the trust. It is the case of Saunders v. Dehu B, mentioned at the outset, and no advantage is acquired by the purchaser for value. The second and the third states of circumstances might possibly occur in respect to a transaction by which a legal estate is acquired subsequently to the original purchase or mortgage. And if they should so occur, then upon all principle, the result must be the same as where the legal estate is acquired under the original transaction. But of course, if it is, if it be supposed that the subsequent transaction takes place after discovery by the purchaser or mortgagee of the faultiness of his own title, and of the fact that the true equitable title lies elsewhere, the second and third stages of circumstances fail to exist and may be discarded from our consideration. This brings us to the fourth state of circumstances in which the trustee is supposed to be ignorant. Say is the legal representative of a former satisfied mortgagee who knows nothing of the subsequent equitable title. While the purchaser or mortgagee has discovered the infirmity of his own title and is aware of the existence of a prior equitable title in someone else. The distinction between this case and that where the fourth state of circumstances occurs in connection with a conveyance from the trustee as part of the original purchase or mortgage transaction is obvious. In the latter, the purchaser or mortgagee parted with his money with knowledge that the person conveying the legal estate was trustee for someone else. He is a he is, as already stated, in no sense a bona fide purchaser for a value without notice. In the former case, he does undoubtedly fill that character, and the only question is whether he is at liberty to avail himself of the ignorance of the trustee to protect the original transaction, which was in every respect bona fide. The head and front of his offending consists only in concealing from the trustee facts which, if disclosed, would show the trustee that he ought to convey not to the purchaser, but to some other person. Does this concealment vitiate the transaction? It is conceived not. In the eye of the court of equity, the purchaser is, in a certain sense, considered to have an equal equity with the claimant prior in time, the trustee conveying, as he does, in ignorance of the true title of which he has no notice, violates no duty, and incurs no liability. And the purchaser or mortgagee acquires and holds the legal estate as a blank and shipper. This view is supported by the judgment of Lord Hatherley when Vice Chancellor and Carter v. Carter A, who after referring to Saunders v. De Dehu, there says that the authorities he had found on the subject 
resulted in this distinction that although you may get in any outstanding legal estate, which a person may bona fide assign to you, you having notice of the intervening encumbrance, he not having any such notice, you cannot procure a conveyance from a trustee who himself has an adverse duty to perform and who by such conveyance would in fact be making over the estate to you to protect you against the very interests which it was his duty to protect. The conclusion arrived at is, however, not free from difficulty. And we find Lord Justice James thus expressing himself on the subject in a recent judgment. But those cases where the person seeking the conveyance knew the fact that the trustee was trustee for somebody else and could not convey without a breach of trust whilst the trustee was left in ignorance. Those cases, I say, involve a principle I have never been able to understand. A, we will now consider two material distinctions between Lord Westbury's second class of cases and the first class. First, under the first class, as we have seen, the person setting up the defense has, as a rule, no legal title and often no title at all, whereas under the second, the defense is available only where the mortgagee or purchaser setting it up has actually obtained a legal estate. By the seventh resolution in Brace v. Duchess of Marlborough, B, the law on the subject is thus laid down. In this case, it appeared that a Pusne encumbrancer bought in a prior mortgage in order to unite the same to the Pusne encumbrance. But it being proved that there was a mortgage prior to that, the court clearly held that the Pusne encumbrancer where he had not got the legal estate or where the legal estate was vested in a trustee could there make no advantage of his mortgage but in all cases where the legal estate is standing out the several encumbrances must be paid according to their priority and point of time qui priori qui prior est in tempore potior est in jure Oh, I didn't look that up yet. <laughs> mm. Mm, I don't want to. <laughs> um, prior in time. Oh, dang it. I don't want to look it up. Qui prior est in tempo. Oh, did I do it right? I think I did. All right. Um, qui prior est tempore potior est jure is a Latin phrase, which means a person before in time is better in right. Priority in time is given preference in law when there are equal equities. The first in order of time must prevail. Maxim qui prior est tempore potior est jure applies only in cases in which the equities are equal. All right. Copy. Okay, what's this one up ahead? It's not gonna let me do it. Oh God, I'm gonna do it later. Write it in later. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the foregoing statement of law was adopted by Lord Hardwick and Wolves. Will be, he will be a where he says wherever the legal estate is standing out, either in a prior encumbrancer or in such a trustee as against whom the quisne encumbrancer is not the best right. To call for the legal estate, the whole title is consideration and consideration is an equity. And then the general maxim is qui prior pre or est tempore potior est jure. This doctrine received a strong application in the case of Rupert v. Harrison. B. Decided by Lord Hatherley, 
when vice chancellor and which a first mortgage with power of sale and a third mortgage taken without notice of a second became both vested in the same person and that person having sold the mortgaged property under the power it was held that there being no longer any legal estate vested in the third mortgage e the surplus proceeds of sale after satisfying the first mortgage could not be retained in satisfaction of the third mortgage, but must go to the second mortgagee. There, Lord Hatherley, after explaining in detail, A, how the legal estate acquired by subsequent encumbrancer is made available as a tabula in naufragio, concludes by saying, all that is a very pe peculiar part of this doctrine, but the court has never gone beyond this. And if it does not find the legal estate interposed, it deals with the money according to the priorities. Finally, the doctrine was made by Lord Westbury, the foundation of his decision in Phillips v. Phillips, B, in which he held that a purchaser for valuable consideration, marriage in the particular instance, without notice of a previously granted annuity, could not, the whole legal estate being outstanding the previous encumbrancers and the interest of the annuity, uh, and the purchaser being alike equitable, rely effectually on defense, the defense of purchase for value without notice against a bill by the annuitant to enforce payment of his annuity. This portion of the decision was equally with that which relates to Williams v. Lamb and Collins v. Archer. C. Dissented from by Lord St. Leonard's on the ground that the question in Phillips v. Phillips was not one of settling priorities, but of affording relief in a contest between adverse equitable claimants. D. In reference to a difference of view between such great authorities, perhaps we ought to say non nostrum not we, but to the writer, it seems that the suit was virtually one to adjust the rights over the property in question of persons claiming inequity only, and that the doctrine qui prior est tempore was correctly applied. I'm going to that up. Non nostrum. An idea for solving a problem, especially one that is not very good. It is for us to settle such disputes among you. See, no, it is not for us. Oh, okay, not we. See, it's not for us. No one wants to. All right, so we were understanding it quickly in the first place. All right. All right, this much seems clear that if the prior legal encumbrancers had filed a foreclosure bill, a right of redemption must have been given to the annuitant in priority to that given to the subsequent purchaser. Secondly, Lord Westbury's observation in reference to the second class, A, where he says that the principle is that a court of equity will not disarm a purchaser falls considerably short of a full statement of what equity does for a purchaser. For in the cases under the second class, equity not only does not disarm him, but actually gives him priority and precedence by reason of the legal estate which he has acquired. The court does not, as in cases arising under the first class, simply say to the plaintiff, we dismiss your bill. We will give you no assistance against the purchaser for value without notice. But it marshals the rights and administers the property, which is the subject of litigation on the footing of the purchaser, 
or mortgagee who has acquired the legal interest having actually the first claim. This difference, of course, is a true a true a attributable to the different natures of the suits. In cases arising under the first class, the plaintiff says, I want assistance. The court says, we cannot give it as against a purchaser for value without notice. You must make what you can of your legal right without our assistance. In the second class of cases, there are various equities attaching to the property under litigation, and the court could not stay its hand altogether without leaving everything in hopeless confusion and doing absolute injustice. This distinction between the two classes of cases is well illustrated by the case of Finch v. Shaw, A, decided by Lord Romilly, and on appeal in the House of Lords. B, the facts material for our purpose are very short. A first legal mortgagee filed a bill against a second mortgagee for foreclosure. Amongst other defenses, the second mortgagee set up that of his being a purchaser for value without notice. The argument in support of the defense was somewhat similar. Singular. The argument in support of the defense was somewhat singular. It had been settled, as we have seen in our discussion, C of Williams v. Lamb and Collins v. Archer, that the defense is a good defense, although a plaintiff may come into equity relying on a legal title. And the contention now was that in all cases. Mm -hmm. Where the plaintiff came into equity relying on a legal title, the defense was a valid defense, and the plaintiff could not, and the plaintiff could have no relief in equity. Or, in effect, that the simple circumstance of the title of the plaintiff being legal was sufficient to prevent the court from giving him any relief against a purchaser for value without notice. It was urged that by the decisions, and more particularly, that of Lord Romley himself and Attorney General V. Wilkins, A, the mortgagee, his title being a legal title, must be left to his remedies at law. Lord Romley, in his judgment after reiterating his view that the defense of purchase for value without notice applied as against a legal right as well as an equitable right, proceeded to discuss the applicability of the defense to cases of mortgage and continued thus, B, in this case, suppose the legal estate was outstanding and that the question was between two equitable encumbrances, both of whom had advanced their money without any notice of any encumbrance on the estate and therefore exactly under the same conditions. If the conduct of the parties were the same, I should give priority to the one who advanced his money prior in point of time. Then could the rights in the situation of the first mortgagee be in the least diminished or injured if he had in addition obtained the legal estate or is the doctrine of a purchaser for valuable consideration? Without notice applicable to that state of things. In my opinion, it is not. Then after referring to Williams v. Lamb and Collins v. Archer in terms which impliedly treat them as well decided, Lord Romilly continues thus, the distinction I apprehend is this, if the suit be for the enforcement of a legal claim or the establishment of a legal right, then although this court may have jurisdiction in the matter, it will not interfere against a purchaser for valuable consideration without notice, but leave the parties to law. If on the other hand, the legal title is perfectly clear and attached to that legal title, there is an equitable remedy or an equitable right, which can only be enforced in this court. I have not found any case, nor am I aware of any, where this court will refuse to enforce any, the equitable remedy, which is incident to the legal right. A. And further on, Lord Romilly points out that although at the moment the plaintiff Collier was unable to bring ejectment by reason of the existence of a prior term securing an annuity, the term might cease at any time and then upon the plaintiff recovering, <sighs> the estate of Bill might be filed against him for redemption and says, if I am not to interfere to grant foreclosure to Mr. Finch, 
Am I to interfere to grant redemption to Mr. Collier? It appears to me impossible for any court to come to a, such a conclusion. Accordingly, Lord Romley made the usual decree for foreclosure. A, on appeal to the House of Lords. B, the decision at the rolls was upheld. Lord Cranworth, Lord Chancellor, in moving the judgment of the House, after stating his agreement in the doctrine that the principle in which the court protects a purchaser for valuable consideration without notice is not confined to the case of a purchaser for valuable consideration who has got the legal estate said. But I think that that doctrine cannot by possibility apply to the case of a bill of foreclosure. And there are reasons for so holding pointed out by the master of the rolls in his judgment. Reasons which are no doubt perfectly satisfactory, but I should proceed on a much shorter ground. For the purpose of the question whether the court would interfere against a purchaser for valuable consideration without notice, a foreclosure is not relief at all. The mortgagee who seeks foreclosure stands in such a position to the mortgagor or the purchaser from the mortgagor for valuable consideration without notice that the purchaser can at any time file a bill to redeem the mortgage. And that being so, it would be most unjust if there was not a correlative right on the part of the mortgagee to say, you shall redeem now or you shall never redeem. Lord Cranworth does not advert to the circumstance that after the conclusion is reached that the defense cannot be set up as a complete bar to a foreclosure suit. The question whether a purchaser for value has or has not a legal estate becomes all important, but this is accounted for by the fact that in the particular case before him, the legal estate was in the plaintiff. The substance of the decision is, it is conceived this, that by the effect of the mortgage surgeon, equitable rights and liabilities were created, which a court of equity could not, without injustice, refuse to recognize and adjust. And that the fact of the plaintiff having the legal estate could afford no just ground for refusing to adjust the equitable rights. Well, I guess we're going to go there now. All right. A, this passage seems to have been intended to suggest a ground on which the decisions in Williams v. Lamb and Collins v. Archer might be supported and at the same time might in their turn serve to strengthen the decision subsequently arrived at in the principal case. If so, Lord Romley here regards the right of foreclosure as an equitable right attached to the legal estate in the mortgagee. It is submitted that it would be more correct to view it as a right correlative to that of redemption, imported equally with the latter into the mortgage contract by courts of equity, and to consider the legal estate as an adjunct to the equitable right. Maybe this is a good place to uh, take a break. There we go. It has more than two chapters. <laughs> Did you get all that? 